I am yeah. in Beirut in our branch offices. Okay, that's great. So you're from uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and uh, we really appreciate the work that you do uh, and your uh, cause and your mission. And we are really happy to have you among us uh, today. And uh, thank you again. I will leave the floor to you and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Christian Chiha and I am the regional psychologist uh, staff counselor for the Middle East and uh, North Africa. But not only, I work with MSF. Uh, so in today's presentation, um, I will be talking about, I'm sorry, I shared a different, uh, okay, this is not the presentation I wanted to share. Okay, so in today's presentation, I'll be talking about, I'll be presenting uh, who are we as MSF. Uh, why there is a need, why WHO came up with a need with uh, uh, guidelines for mental health at work. What do we do in MSF in terms of staff uh, support? What are our challenges on the field? And uh, lastly, I would talk about uh, how to promote optimal health and well-being. So, uh, MSF is an independent uh, NGO who provides medical assistance to people affected by conflict, epidemics, disaster, or people who are excluded from healthcare or that doesn't have uh, availability of a good healthcare system. Our actions are guided by medical ethics, principle of impartiality, independence, and neutrality. Um, MSF was founded in 1971 by a small group of French and doctor journalists. We are founded mainly by private, uh, the private sector. There is a limited part given by governmental, uh, governments or intergovernmental organization. Uh, why is there a need for staff psychosocial support? So as you know, medical MSF is a medical organization. And at first, the medical, the mental health was not part of its program. Uh, the medic, the stuff, uh, the mental health for beneficiaries uh, was started in the 90s and it was focused only on big traumatic events. Uh, the staff support emerged more or less 10 years later after realizing that the staff were exposed to violent context and they were affected on the short and long term. So in this uh, presentation, I'll be talking more about the staff support that we provide in order to, for them to uh, cater or to deliver uh, a mental health, uh, a, a sort of medical services uh, up to the expected level. Uh, in the PSCU MENA, it was created in 2018 because of the need of the language and cultural background. So we serve Arabic, 14 Arabic speaking countries. Um, you must know that we, in our projects, we have international staff and we have locally recruited staff. So I'm, I work mainly with the locally recruited staff who are Arabic speaking in the MENA. Our object, objective if, is to reduce the stress level among, among the local staff in the area, MENA area, but I always, I sometimes fly outside MENA area and we're going to see it a little bit later. So my main objective today is to talk about uh, why WHO actually started the guidelines. So uh, according to WHO, mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables people to co cope with the stress of life, to realize their ability, to learn well and work well, and to contribute to the communities. Uh, according to WHO, again, an estimated 15% of working age adults have mental disorder at any point in time. So this is something that is very interesting, very big and very um, um, interesting actually to know. So according to WHO, and this is why they came up with a guideline on mental health at work, globally as of 2019 and each year, uh, 301 million people were living in anxiety. 
to 80 million people were living with depression, 64 million people were living with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, 703,000 people died by suicide, and around 60% of global working population are informal uh, economy. And what I mean by informal uh, economy, uh, um, we're talking about uh, daily workers, um, workers, uh, domestic workers, people who have who doesn't have access to health, they have low income, and they have poor uh, working conditions. And these are 60% of the global worker population, which is a big uh, chunk. So again, according to WHO, the depression and anxiety are estimated to cost a global economy of one trillion dollar each year. It's a huge number. The size of the public health problem of mental health conditions is greater than the volume invested to address it. So this is why the need is for mental health at work. And this is why I will be um, stressing on our mental health support to the staff. So what do we do in MSF? Uh, the main thing, one of part of our strategy is to deliver psychoeducation during our field visits. And when I say psychoeducation, mainly it's stress management and to help our staff to develop their coping mechanism. You would think that it's a standard procedure that we do. You would think that we deliver the same awareness campaign, which is not at all. And I will show you why, what challenges uh, we face during our operation level in MSF. So, uh, talking about the NINA, most of all, but not only, uh, I will start with Northeast Syria that we cover and the war aftermath. So you might not know, but uh, Northeast Syria has been, I mean, the whole Syria was in at war and the Northeast, Northeast uh, has the biggest camp. Uh, it's a detention camp actually, because it's a prison, open air prison. It's called Al Hol. It has around 60,000 people living inside the camp. Uh, why I'm saying it's a detention camp? Because people are not allowed to leave and they are not even allowed to, um, to move inside the camp from section to section. It's a huge camp. It's divided into sections, around nine sections, 10 sections, and people are not allowed to move around. It is mainly uh, composed uh, by from women and children. So the problematic is huge inside. We cater, we deliver uh, medical support. We have mobile clinics. They have limited access, but they can access some of the sections. Our staff or are, are under stress. They are sometimes attacked by kids and the attack are not minor. So the, the st stress level of our staff is big, uh, and this is why we cannot deliver the, the uh, standard uh, stress management that we usually do. Um, in more than, uh, apart than Al Hol, we have another places where we, uh, we work with. Uh, we work in um, main areas in Northwest and Northeast, uh, and they have uh, different uh, backgrounds. So uh, it is in an area is very impoverished, low income, a high level of pollution, and they don't have running water. Why am I telling you this? Because if we want to develop coping mechanism, we cannot, there is something that we should find and we should cater for the, the area and uh, one of the usually standard um, standard procedure that we give for coping mechanism is to go outside, to have a walk, to play football outside. And this is something that we cannot address in Northeast because of the high, very high pollution. Uh, the, the pollution is due to generators because there's no electricity. So each home has its own generator. So you would imagine the the population, I mean the the pollution in the air. So 
I'm telling you this because this is where we have to find very small areas or windows, how to support our staff uh, and to be able for them to deliver the medical services in very high uh, hardship con context. Uh, if we want to talk to, about Northwest Syria, uh, Northwest Syria was already before the earthquake, what was already um, an area where uh, afflicted by the war, by the conflict, very uh, poor settings where it's full of camps, tents already internally displaced people, uh, living conditions are very difficult. Added to this, we had the earthquake. So I'm talking about Northwest because in my last visit, I passed from Syria, from uh, Turkey actually to Syria. So along the road, I saw the difference in management of the earthquake between Turkey and Syria. Uh, in the Turkey side, uh, you can, the only uh, 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 aftermath of the earthquake are the building. They are um, uh, cracked, but they are all evacuated. People are living in already in prefab uh, uh, homes. They are living in tents. They are well taken care of, more or less, if I can say so. So you, uh, the, the building that are totally co collapsed are already you don't see it. I mean, they are, it's already evacuated. It's already uh, taken care of. And they have experts who have um, visited all the affected areas and everything is taken well care of. Whereas a few meters away, when you pass to Syria, you see that everything has been as it is. The buildings are half collapsed and people are still living in the buildings. Uh, in the in the ground in the uh, fl ground floor, uh, it is really uh, heartbreaking to see people living in tents in their own gardens. They don't know if they can live, go back to their houses. Um, you see that uh, life is coming back in buildings that are already cracked. Uh, all stores are open, and this is something uh, very surprising to see. Uh, and people apparently they they need to live. They need to to provide their daily uh, breadwinning for their families. So there is no security whatsoever, and uh, this is added to already very low income and very difficult living conditions. Despite everything, I saw something very surprising with our staff. They are very resilient. They manage to have the sense of humor that uh, we can find uh, in Lebanese with Lebanese people. It was very uh, surprising, not, not only not surprising, but due to circumstances, uh, the, the level of resilience was very nice to see. And I was able to give or to add a little bit more of tips for coping mechanism. And um, it was surprising and it was very different from other uh, field visit that I did. Moving on to uh, Iraq. Well, you know that Iraq uh, has been through war. It was really very hard for Iraq. It's mainly security wise, it's a little bit better. Uh, but we have a huge community, ethnic uh, community, very small uh, uh, people from different backgrounds living together. And it is in some parts, it's not that easy as you may think. In North, uh, there is the still the, um, the ISIS ideology in uh, some areas where it's very difficult uh, for women to work and they have to work. So you would imagine the woman conditions living in, in such a very closed environment they are harassed from their own families, uh, from the environment, from their neighbors, but they have to work. And this is very difficult. Uh, it is difficult to uh, to manage their stress and to give them some kind of tips to find adaptive tips they can uh, use in order to diminish their stress. So this is another kind of um, of man, uh, stress management that we have to to think of and to deliver. Um, 
in Baghdad is different. Baghdad is a big city, but the living conditions are still very hard. It's a very, very, very crowded city and commuting is very difficult. So uh, staff, MSF staff struggle to arrive on time and this is very stressful for them. Um, plus, we still have this kind of um, uh, tension between women and men working together. So this is another kind of stress level, stress management that we have to cater and think of. Um, so this is regarding Iraq. Um, uh, we, or we support our Palestine uh, uh, staff. We do it online for obvious reason, but this is another totally different kind of uh, uh, stress that we find, and this is very difficult for us as staff counselor, because most of Palestinians, mainly living in Gaza, Gaza is a very small strip, as you can see. Uh, it is almost a prison. People cannot get out of Gaza Strip uh, without a specific special permission and it's very difficult to get and uh, why am I telling you this because people they all know each other it's like they live in one uh, big city but everyone knows everyone so the trust they have big trust issues they are very afraid that if they come up with something they say something it might be known by everyone so any kind of harassment, any kind of uh, power abuse, any kind of anything that is related that can uh, uh, give stress to, to our staff, they are not at all keen on sharing. So this is, you can imagine how, how difficult it is for us to break the ice and to be able to help them in one way or another. So this is another kind of problem that we face uh, in Palestine. So Sudan is a very difficult country in terms of weather condition. Uh, very harsh. The rainy season is devastating. Uh, uh, the, um, it's very hot, very difficult. It's a poor country. And uh, on top of this, uh, the, the women condition is very, very difficult. It's a very conservative environment. Uh, the, P the, the psychosocial support is a huge stigma. Uh, people have difficulties uh, coming for uh, attending sessions because most of the sessions we provide are uh, on voluntary basis. We cannot uh, oblige everyone to uh, to attend, so it's very difficult to motivate people uh, to come and and um, assist to our, our group sessions, and it's really difficult to let people. Uh, uh, um, how do we say? Uh, uh, um, attend to the session uh, and uh, benefit from the sessions and you it's by I mean it is very uh, difficult for us to find tips the appropriate tips for them uh, uh, to uh, uh, find adaptive coping mechanism in order to lower the stress and by default the stress level is is big according the uh, to the conditions of the country. We try as much as possible to find the appropriate uh, working environment because most of them, they find it very uh, um, welcoming to work. Uh, they like it. They like to get out of their house, especially women. Um, they would do anything to keep their job. Uh, they're very motivated. So we try as much as possible to find and to build a, an adaptive a, and very welcoming uh, uh, environment for them to be able to find any kind of safe environment. Uh, so this is regarding Sudan. Uh, well, we are in Jordan, Amman, even though uh, the country has no armed conflict, but uh, we have uh, in some areas there are issues with the health system, so that's why we're there. Um, <clears throat> and the Amman is, the problematic in Amman is the weight of the culture. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, so the culture is, um, is difficult, uh, mainly for the women. Uh, there is tension 
uh, between men and working women, especially when women are assigned uh, supervision or let's say leadership uh, uh, position. Uh, and it is really uh, very difficult to cope with. Okay, uh, so this is another kind of stress management, another kind of coping mechanism that we should find adaptive. Uh, as in most of Middle East areas, people are not used to uh, use workout or to do workout or um, to to um, to do any activity, sports activity. So this is something that is not really uh, appropriate to to uh, to uh, propose. So this is very difficult to toggle between what we have and what we can offer. Uh, lastly, I will talk about Haiti because I was in Haiti, although it's not in the MENA, but I went last year for two times. Haiti, just to give you a little bit of geography, is a big island. Uh, it is an island actually facing USA. It's divided into sections. Uh, one is Haiti, the other part is St. Dominican Island. St. Dominican Island is the uh, number one uh, touristic destination lately. Uh, very developed with very nice uh, sand beach and, and everything that goes with it. And uh, the other part is Haiti, which is a totally, totally devastated island, one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, where there is no security whatsoever, street gangs are everywhere. It is the living condition are hell. And our staff has to travel every day to come to work. And every day back and forth is an adventure for them. It's very difficult because they are facing kidnapping, they are facing street gangs that uh, that ask for ransom. If they kidnap people, uh, they might face uh, uh, just killing in the uh, cold, killing in street. So it's very difficult. And supporting our staff in order to be able to uh, cater the, the good or the quality medical uh, assistance that we need is very challenging in Haiti. Uh, they, I mean, the, the normal and standard coping mechanism and self-care that we usually can cater or can uh, propose in other areas are uh, closer to null in, in, um, uh, in Haiti. So uh, this is very, it, it was a very interesting experience for me and at the same time very, very difficult. Um, this is uh, regard regarding our staff uh, on the operational level, uh, but any, uh, despite everything, despite the difficulty, we still can uh, prevent or we still can uh, offer uh, some kind of ways to prevent uh, the disorders, the mental health disorders that anyone can face, as we said. So what do we do in prevention to prevent? Uh, mainly it's self-care, and I like this quote by Katya Reed. It says, self-care is giving the world the best of you instead of what's left of you. This is why self-care is very important. I'm going to run through it very quickly just for you to be able to have an idea why self-care is very important. So according to the Journal uh, of Nursing Studies, uh, it's a... Uh, it's, um, a medical journal, application of self-care have been present in the community long before healthcare system, and it is some way people are relying on self-care because they don't have access to, to healthcare uh, uh, services. So uh, it is important on, on a personal level. And uh, um, the concept of self-care was very, very uh, uh, relevant during COVID. We all know why. And the epidemic outbreak has had a massive impact on the health on the healthcare system uh, and including primary care settings. So, I will start with what is not self-care. Uh, self-care is not is definitely not the cure, but it's a way to avoid the harm, the burnout, the anxiety, the depression. So, uh, it is. It is not the solution. 
it is not the solution, uh, uh, but it's a, it's a mean that uh, that we have to uh, we have to adopt. Uh, we will see why. So self care is not indulgent and it's not being selfish. And this is a concept that I hear a lot during all my visits everywhere I've been. So for them, how can I do self care? This is something very selfish. If I have time, I should give it to my family. I don't have time for this. I don't have time. I don't have the money to go on vacations. It's a luxury and so on. I hear it a lot. Um, and this is a very, it's a, it's a misconception that a lot of people has it. We're going to see it if, uh, in a little bit of, uh, further why. And while self-care might sound like a cliche, you won't feel its benefit until you really try it. So, uh, according to another article in the Journal of Nursing Studies, uh, the definition uh, of self-care is the ability to care for oneself through awareness, self-control, self-reliance, in order to achieve, maintain, or promote optimal health and well-being. Um, so, unfortunately, we will have we will. It's not the 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 main uh, uh, subject of our uh, presentation. I won't be really able to go through self-care, why awareness, self-control is very important. But I'm just giving an overview, and this is an entry point for you guys to uh, go deeper uh, in order to find uh, the the right self-care. So, according to Dr. Lopez, uh, the need for self-care is obvious. We have an epidemic of anxiety and depression. Everyone feels it, and I'm sure you feel it. And not only in the Middle East, because we are under a lot of uh, problems and conflicts in the whole world. Depression and anxiety is a big, huge problem. So, how can I practice self-care? Let me tell you something. If you Google self-care, you will find a huge amount of tips and something that talks to you and something that is not even relevant for you. The problem is you have to decide to define what is good for you on your own terms. You have to discover what makes you feel good and what is good for you. And self-care doesn't have to cost a fortune. It's not a vacation that you take once a year. You go, I don't know, take a trip or somewhere. It could be definitely if you have the means, but not only. Self-care is something that you should do and you can do on a daily basis. Um, what I mean by disconnect and reconnect, you all know, I mean, you probably know that anxiety and stress, the first or one of the symptoms is overthinking. And the overthinking is very tiring. So by disconnect, I mean finding a way to disconnect. And this is very technical. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into it. But there are technical uh, ways that we can use to disconnect. And by reconnect, I mean to reconnect to our presence, to our the moment we are living in. Because the moment we are living in now cannot be stressful. We stress about the future. We stress about our past, but now where we are living now, the moment we are living is not stressful. So disconnect and reconnect is very important. One of the main technical, uh, let's say, a technique is mindfulness. Again, if you Google mindfulness, lots and lots of exercises, you can find what is good for you and what is not good for you. Um, and one of the main importance of self-care is the principle of resilience, which are optimism, positivity, gratitude, and the sense of humor. You might think it's cliche, but it's not. Uh, in every, even if in the most difficult environment, uh, focusing on the small positivity that we have and being grateful for it, is a big uh, asset, and this is what I try to do in all, everywhere I, I travel, as I was telling you that the, the conditions are very difficult, but I still can find with their help, with the help of the staff living on daily basis in that condition, we can still find positivity 
to build our gratitude on and to develop our sense of humor because this is the most important thing and this is what keeps us running the positivity and the optimism despite all. So I will not go through um, the whole uh, working place. Again, that's at Care in Workplace. Again, you can find a lot of tips. Uh, what I like is uh, the decorating your, your desk. So uh, most of us spend most of our time on our desk. It would be nice to personalize it. Uh, what I like personally is finding quotes. Uh, every week I change my positive quotes. I have a lot, a big load of positive quotes. There are a lot on, on the internet. So uh, printing them, putting them somewhere that you can see um, somewhere when, when someone is visiting your office, it's really refreshing to see positive quotes. It gives a, a sense of optimism. Um, and what I always advise my staff or the staff I work with or the people I know is to take a day off when it is too much. Uh, a day off is really refreshing. And when I mean by day off, it's really disconnect because lots of people I know they take a day off to finish the work they had, to run some some errands uh, uh, for the house, to do the cooking, the cleaning. This is not a day off. A day off is really the ability to switch off everything and to take some time for us. And when I mean by selfish, when I when I tell people and they tell me it is selfish, it is not selfish because when I recharge my battery, I will be able to take care of the others much, much better than if my batteries are low. So according to Mayo Clinic, when we talk about uh, a day, you know, Mayo Clinic, by the way, is a non-profit organization committed to clinical practice. So according to them, there are many rewards to taking a day off, work to get rested, rejuvenating during a difficult, stressful period of your life. Mental health days are known to prevent further or worsening mental issues, combat burnout, help you feel less lonely, improve your overall attitude, increase your productivity, and even help you get back on track with your physical health. I'm not sure if you know, but the mental condition can be very difficult and can affect your physical health. And this is now uh, very widely spread in the medical uh, field. Everyone knows uh, that the, a good mental health, a healthy mental health can really prevent physical problems. Most of them and the most known is cardiac diseases. And now there are studies uh, uh, saying that the stress can uh, uh, can cause cancer, unfortunately, some cancers definitely. So it could be one of the, um, the reasons why people are having uh, cancer. So to finish, I will be talking about uh, the UN mental health system and well-being strategies. They came up definitely. They have their own well-being strategy. But what I like about it, they talk about distress and suffering related to symptoms of mental illness and psychological pain can be as disabling as physical pain and can cause, I'm adding, can cause physical pain too. Our mental health directly influences how we think, feel, and act. It also affects our physical health. Work, in fact, is actually one of the best things for protecting our mental health, but it it can also adversely, uh, adversely affect it. So working place, as I saw it in many of uh, the visited country, I visited country is a relief for them. It's a way to cut off from their difficult conditions at home. But at the same time, it could be, uh, um, ad it can affect them. So this is why our main uh, mission uh, in in, ment in uh, MSF is to provide a healthy and safe working place for our staff. And thank you for your time. And I'm available for any question. Um, if anyone wants.
Thank you so much, Ms. Christian. It was a Thank very you. interesting uh, session. Um, if anyone has a question, please feel free to either unmute yourselves or send it via chat. I'm also sharing with you in the chat box if you, a feedback link. If you can, please take a minute to fill it in. And Ms. Christian, I will definitely share with you the answers once we receive them. Thank you. OK, so everyone is thanking you for the in the chat box. Uh, I think everything was very clear. And they are sending you applauses. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone.